welcome to this GCSE Ready Project D which focuses on Elizabeth I and the Spanish Armada. You will need with you the lesson notes template that goes with this lesson which you should be able to find if you go to class charts or if you look in the description at the bottom of this video. Okay you will see this image under the heading task one on page two of your lesson notes template. Um, it's a very famous portrait of Elizabeth I. We probably have some prior knowledge of Elizabeth I from our studies in Key Stage 3, from just our general understanding of British history. We may have done something about this in primary school. What I'd like you to do now is in a moment pause me and then try and write down as many things as you can remember that you already know about Elizabeth I and her reign as Queen. Right, welcome back. Um, as a way of checking to see how much you already know um, and to give you the opportunity to add some extras to the things that you've written down, have a look at this clip which gives you a little potted summary of the importance of Elizabeth I and the key aspects of her reign. Elizabeth I was a rainbow of characteristics. She was cunning, she was vain, she was kind, she was very smart, and she was very manipulative. The daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth was born on September 7, 1533. Elizabeth I's childhood was tumultuous after her father executed her mother. After her father and brother died, Elizabeth's older sister Mary took the throne. Mary's Catholic background and Elizabeth's Protestant background kind of created a situation where Mary just really couldn't trust Elizabeth. She threw her in the tower for a while and let her live there. Mary died in 1558, leaving Elizabeth Queen of England. Her father and her sister had created such turmoil between the Catholics and the Protestants, falling into and out of favor. People were now for sure what they should say that they believe in. Elizabeth carefully rewarded the Book of Common Prayer and said, If you're close enough to this, it's good for England. Elizabeth set the stage for the economy and the arts, particularly fashion and theater, to flourish. Because she's a female monarch, she knows that she can use her appearance in court to create a kind of loyalty and affection to her from the courtiers. Not only through appearing in fantastic outfits, but in being painted in fantastic outfits that symbolize her leadership of the state. In 1567, Elizabeth arrested her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, for her alleged involvement in several assassination attempts and had her executed in 1587. Though Elizabeth's reign was solidified, at 34 years old, she had yet to marry and produce an heir. It's very clear that she didn't want to do what her sister had done, which was to marry a powerful European monarch who would regard himself as a co-ruler. It's also likely that she didn't want one of her own subjects to become her husband, which would give him a kind of power and authority over her. In 1588, Elizabeth's navy defeated the invading Spanish Armada, the most powerful force in Europe at the time. The King of Spain who had thought that God was on his side and had told him to do this, thought, God does not favor me, I was wrong. That's Elizabeth's triumph, to really take the heart out of the King of Spain. Elizabeth I died on March 24th, 1603, after ruling for 44 years. Her death and the succession of her cousin James I of England and Scotland would end the 117 years of the Tudor dynasty. Elizabeth I should be remembered, first of all, as a brilliant survivor. She had a lot of odds against her from the time of her birth onwards. Not only did she survive, she survived with great success. Okay, so you should have um, got a lot from that clip about the importance of Elizabeth and about the challenges of her reign that she overcame. The main focus of this particular project is to look at the Spanish Armada, the reasons that the Spanish Armada was sent, and the reasons that the Spanish Armada failed, and the way in which that failure was used 
by Elizabeth to cement her legacy as one of the great monarchs of British history. So, if you look at your lesson notes booklet, you should see on page three a table that looks quite a lot like this. And you are going to use this table to collect some information about the long-term reasons and the short-term reasons why Philip of Spain decided to send the Armada. You will need the information on the next few pages of your booklet that looks like this. So in a moment I want you to pause this video and have a go at using the information to fill in the table of the short and long-term reasons why Philip of Spain decided to launch the Spanish Armada. Before that you're going to see a quick clip that's also going to give you some short and long-term reasons. So watch the clip, then pause, then have a go at filling in the table and then we'll come back and see what you have come up with. The news of Mary's execution exploded across the Catholic world. It gave Philip of Spain the excuse he needed to declare war on the heretic queen. Philip ordered the Duke of Parma to prepare an army in the Netherlands for the invasion of England. The Armada would sail from Spain to collect Parma's force and land them on the English coast. Philip's deadly intentions were no secret. Reluctantly, Elizabeth ordered that the English fleet be readied for the threat. Even now, she hoped to avoid war. She tried negotiating with Palmer as the Armada set sail. But there was no mood for compromise amongst her Catholic opponents. She's an incestuous bastard, begotten and born in sin of an infamous courtesan. Cardinal William Allen, June 1588. English lookouts scoured the horizon for enemy sails. They sighted them on July the 19th. Okay, welcome back. So, at the start of that video clip that came before you started doing your notes, it mentioned the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, that swept across the Catholic parts of Europe and people were shocked by it. And the suggestion was that this was one of the reasons why Philip of Spain decided to send the Armada. And to a certain extent that's correct. Uh, the long-term reasons we could say why he sent the Armada were to do with this Catholic versus Protestant conflict in Europe and he saw Elizabeth as the heretic Protestant ruler who was most in need of being corrected. She was most in need of being removed so that Catholicism could be restored to England. And so the long-term reasons are to do with some religious differences between Spain and England, and I guess the short-term element of that is that Mary Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic queen, was executed, and that angered Philip of Spain. Actually, Elizabeth executed Mary Queen of Scots because she knew the Armada was on its way, and she didn't want Mary Queen of Scots as an extra threat. So the, the extent to which her execution prompted the Armada is probably quite small, but certainly a long-term reason is religion. A further long-term reason is the political and commercial rivalry between Spain and England that you should have noted down. This rivalry over the New World, over treasures, over um, commercial enterprises, trying to make as much money out of um, discovering the Americas and the friction and tension that was caused by the pirates like Sir Francis Drake that were causing um, destruction to Spanish ships and stealing from Spanish merchants. The further long-term reasons are Elizabeth's involvement in the Spanish Netherlands where she is trying to help the Dutch rebels against the Spanish and that is causing tension as well. So there's religious, political, economic um, long-term reasons why he sent the Armada and the shorter term reasons are largely to do with Elizabeth's direct involvement in the Netherlands. Her involvement with Spain, Sir Francis Drake's 
attacks on the Spanish became greater in the mid to late 1580s and this is what prompted Philip in the short term to get his armada together and to send it across to try and depose Elizabeth. Now I think it's important to note that this attempt to remove Elizabeth was a long-term project. Philip of Spain did not just send one armada, he sent several and so therefore it's the longer term reasons, it's the longer term political, religious, economic rivalry between Spain and England that's the main reason for the Armada, not the short term reasons. Here is a slightly light hearted look at some of the long term campaign that Philip had to try and remove Elizabeth and restore Catholicism to England. He was the most powerful man in the world, ruler of a huge empire. I will invade England with the most terrible force of battleships ever seen. I shall call it the most terrible force of battleships ever seen. Or you could call it the Armada, Your Majesty. Yes, Kachi. It feels better. Spanish Armada. Only one man stood between Philip and his prize. That'll be me. Introducing Sir Francis Drake as Vice Admiral of the English Navy. Make the fleet ready to sail. Tell Drake this armada must be stopped at all costs. He was a man with a plan. We shall blow up the Spanish cork factory at Cadiz. Uh, why? No cork, no barrels. No barrels, no fresh water. No fresh water, no armada. Brilliant. I am, aren't I? So, to cut a long story short, no cork, no armada. I'll be back. Oh, good catchphrase. Gracias. De nada. Better luck next time. 1588. This time it's Judgment Year. Spanish Armada 2. He was the most powerful man. Oh, yada yada, we know this bit. Is my armada ready? It is, sire. Do my barrels have corks? They do, sire. Nothing can stop us now. Oh, oh I'm bad. Only one man stood between Philip and his prize. Oh, not him again. Set fire to some of our ships. Uh, why? We sail these fire ships towards the Spanish fleet. The Spanish will panic, cut their anchor lines and set sail. With any luck, the strong winds will destroy this armada. A man with a plan and some lucky wind. It's a disaster, master. We have lost more than 50 sheep. And now the good news? Um... It's venison for supper. Destroyed by the weather, you say? <laughs> that is the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, apart from Sir Walter Raleigh's joke about the bear with the big paws. <laughs> I'll be back, I think, probably. 1595. This must be judgment year. Spanish Armada 3. What news of my new armada? Has it at last been successful? It has caused minor damage to Mausol. Mausol? Mausol, an inconsequential little village in Cornwall, yay! I'll be back. Maybe it might take a while. They're back. 1596. Maybe this is judgment year. Spanish Armada 4. I don't care what happens as long as my fleet of 140 galleons wasn't wrecked by storms off the English coast. It wasn't. It never got that far. It was okay, so, um, although it was presented in a slightly facetious and light-hearted way, um, Spain did attempt on several occasions between 1587 and 1596 to send an armada to depose Elizabeth. So if we're thinking about why they did this, and we're thinking seriously about it, then what we're saying is that there are some long-term underlying political, religious and economic tensions between England and Spain that lie at the heart of the reason why Philip sent the Armada in 1588. Okay, we now move to task three, which focuses on why the Armada failed. So Philip is hugely committed to this attempt to overthrow Elizabeth. He is desperate to restore Catholicism, to remove her as this Protestant heretic bastard as he very um, cruelly called her um, and he was determined so the question is if he was so determined and he was so desperate to do it why did he fail uh, and we can probably categorize the reasons for failure 
into three areas. Reasons connected to English skill and tactics, the things that the English got right, that they were good at. Reasons to do with things that the Spanish failed at, the problems that they had. And some reasons that were just to do with luck or circumstances. So, I want you to go to task three in your booklet. I want you to use the information that is on the following two pages. And I want you to make some notes on why the Armada failed just bullet point the information underneath those three headings Was it reasons connected to English skill and tactics reasons to do with Spanish failures or reasons to do with luck or just circumstance okay welcome back hopefully you've managed to get down some important points under each of the three headings just to help you with a little bit more now I'm going to show you this clip um, which expands in more detail on the reasons why the Armada failed and you can add some further pieces of evidence under the three headings Commanded by the Duke of Medina Sidonia, it was to meet up with an invasion force under the command of the Duke of Parma in Flanders. The army would then cross over and land in the south of England, quickly seizing London. There was a setback, however, in April 1587 when Sir Francis Drake raided Cadiz, destroying or capturing over 30 Spanish ships. But a year later, the Armada was ready, setting sail from A. Coruna on the 21st of July 1588. With their extensive network of spies all over Europe, the English were well informed of the Spanish king's intentions and had their own navy ready and waiting on the south coast. Their commander-in-chief was High Admiral Lord Howard of Effingham, supported by a number of famous commanders including Drake and fellow privateer John Hawkins and Martin Frobisher. The nature of naval warfare had changed significantly during the 16th century. Medieval fleets had mostly consisted of merchant ships pressed into service on a temporary basis. Only recently had the governments of the day had the resources to fund the construction of specialized warships and to maintain permanent navies. The increased use of gunpowder was a Another major factor that had changed the face of naval combat. Medieval ships had acted like floating castles. Encounters between ships consisted mostly of boarding actions with wooden towers on the bow and stern serving as shooting platforms. From 1500 onwards, warships like the Mary Rose had started to come fitted with gun ports designed to deliver devastating broadsides to the enemy. But this was a transitional period and boarding was still very much in use as a standard tactic. The transitional nature of naval warfare in the 16th century was reflected in the makeup of the fleets. The core of the Catholic fleet consisted of 22 large galleons, which were armed with cannon, but mostly designed for transport, and four oar-powered galleasses. They were supported by over a hundred armed merchant vessels. A total of 18,000 men were on board the ships. Combined with the army in Flanders, this would have amounted to an invasion force of over 50,000, and a huge number of men for the time. The English had 34 race-built warships developed by John Hawkins which were smaller and more maneuverable than the Spanish galleons. These were supported by 163 merchant vessels. The English fleet received word on the 29th of July that the Spanish had been sighted off the coast of Cornwall. They managed to outmaneuver the Armada under the cover of darkness. And on the 31st of July, the first action was fought off Plymouth. From their superior upwind position, the English bombarded the Spanish from afar denying them the advantage that the larger ships would have had at close range. They failed to sink any ships, although two Spanish vessels were abandoned after colliding. As the Armada headed east along the south coast of England, another similarly indecisive action was fought off Portland. The Spanish then tried to enter the Solent, where they could take shelter and wait for the Duke of Parma's army to give word that it was ready to cross. But the English fleet fended them off, and they decided to head to Calais instead. Communication had always been a major problem. Arriving at Calais on the 6th of August, it quickly became clear that the army at Dunkirk had been severely reduced by disease and still needed preparation. The Armada would therefore be forced to anchor, unable to find shelter, and vulnerable to attack. Now, on the evening of the 7th, the English fleet arrived, finding the Armada moored in a crescent formation. That night, they sent out eight fire ships, which they set alight and left to drift towards the enemy. In panic, the crews cut the anchor cable and left the ships 
place to drift downwind. By morning, the Spanish were in a state of chaos, and the stage was set for the Battle of Graveline. The English approached the Spanish ships for the big showdown. They wanted a decisive action this time, but they worked out that they needed to get within 100 meters in order to penetrate the Golian's holes. They would need a plan in order to get this close without being sunk first, but the Spanish had some key tactical weaknesses that they could exploit. The Spanish naval doctrine was in many ways still stuck in the old medieval mindset, favoring boarding actions where their superior manpower would play to their advantage. Their ships were also stocked to the gills with supplies for the invasion. This meant that many of the gun decks were so crowded that the cannons couldn't be brought into the position to reload properly after firing. The idea was, therefore, for the gun crews to just fire one salvo, then get onto the position for boarding. The English, on the other hand, knew what sort of key role that cannon could play in naval warfare. They therefore got just close enough to provoke a single ineffectual salvo from the Spanish, then quickly closed in an open fire. The ship's crews were close enough to exchange musket fire, but the English used their maneuverability to avoid getting boarded. They just carried on pounding the Spanish holes for the next eight hours until being forced to withdraw for lack of ammunition. In total, five Spanish ships were sunk, ran aground, or were captured. Many others were badly damaged, and it was now clear to the Spanish that there would be no invasion. The bulk of the Spanish fleet would likely have been driven aground had the wind not suddenly backed south. They escaped north, pursued, and hurried up the east coast of of England. The only choice for them now was to head back to Spain by passing anti-clockwise around the British Isles. The English ended their pursuit on the 12th of August, off the Firth of Forth. It was not long after that disaster truly struck the Invincible Armada. The Spanish hoped to head westward into the comparatively safe water of the Atlantic before turning south towards home. However, these were the days before longitude could accurately be measured. Unbeknownst to the Spanish, the Gulf Stream was carrying the ships northeast, and they ended up steering south far earlier than they intended, passing perilously close to the west coast of Ireland. Strong winds pushed them into the rocky shore. Having abandoned their anchors at Gravelines, they could not take shelter and ran aground. Local inhabitants and English troops looted the ships and killed the crews. Around 35 of the Spanish ships were lost. The Atlantic Ocean had taken a far greater toll than the English cannon ever did. When the remains of the Armada finally reached Spain again in September and October 1588, many of the men on board were dead from disease or starvation. Less than 10,000 remained. Of the 130 ships that had set sail, 67 made it back. England had lost less than 100 men in battle, but disease was just as big a problem for them, claiming several thousand. The Spanish Armada was seen as a major propaganda victory for Europe's Protestants, and ultimately became part of British national mythology. So what's crucially important here is that some of the naval superiority that the English had, the better um, ships, the more maneuverability, the better firepower they had, that was really, really important. But there was also quite a large flaw in the Spanish plan. The problems of communication, the problems of the um, inability to be flexible in the plan, inability to, to organize the logistics of the plan correctly, also contributed, as did just the sheer look of the wind changing direction of the um, storms that ended up decimating the Armada before it was limped its way back to Spain. Now, the clip that you watched mentioned at the end the idea that the Armada has found a place in British national mythology, and it has in the sense that it is seen, the Spanish defeat and the English victory, as the springboard for the beginning of English superiority in naval power and the beginning of the British Empire that lasted long into the 19th century. If you look at task 4 now, you will see this portrait, very famous portrait that Elizabeth uh, had painted of her and it speaks of the victory over the Spanish in the Armada, but it also speaks of something more significant. It's about Elizabeth project projecting her image, and it's about Elizabeth projecting an image for, for England long into the future. What it asks you to do in task four is to make some inferences from this painting 
about what Elizabeth is trying to communicate. What is it that she is trying to get people to think of her as and what sort of image of herself and England is she trying to communicate through this painting. So pause this and have a go at drawing some inferences from the painting. Okay, welcome back. Before we go any further and look at the inference in a little bit more depth, have a look at this little clip here. The painting was owned and perhaps commissioned by Sir Francis Drake, the great circumnavigator. The Spanish Armada was the response of King Philip II of Spain to repeated English aggression against the Spanish Empire, both abroad and at home. Philip decided to quell England once and for all by sending the Armada. And here it is at the top, maintaining this perfect crescent of a defensive formation as it sails up the channel towards the Spanish Netherlands. And suddenly, the wind, which had been favourable, turns into a fierce southerly, and it blows them north, away from their rendezvous in the Netherlands, right up the east coast of England, and they flee before it. What had Elizabeth been doing whilst the Armada was taking place? The truth is, she'd been desperately hoping it would go away. But once it did set sail, she puts on this magnificent public image. And she delivers one of the great set-piece speeches of her reign. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. I and of a king of England too. Wonderful stuff. But she'd no need to fight. Instead, here she sits after the victory of her sailors, with her hand resting on the globe. It is a prophecy of future and of empire. And so what we see in this painting, and what we can infer from it, you look at the two panels, you look at the, the window on the top left and the window on the top right, we see the Armada arriving, we see the Armada defeated. We see Elizabeth, as Starkey suggested, with her hand on the globe. Um, so we infer that this painting projects an image of her power. It celebrates the victory of England against the Armada. By placing her hand on the globe, it suggests the power that England has moving forward and the naval power that England has. Um, look at the finery that she is wearing. Look at this image of power and wealth that she is projecting. Um, in a way that suggests that the future for England and the future for Elizabeth is incredibly prosperous and incredibly advantageous and she is soaking up the glory and the victory because the Armada has been defeated. Okay, the final task of this little mini project is task 5, and it, it revolves around this question here, a 16 mark question. This is the sort of 16 mark question that comes at the end of the Elizabeth exam and the end of the medicine exam also. It says, the effective use of naval tactics was the main reason for the English victory over the Spanish Armada. How far do you agree? Explain your answer. So. These sorts of answers require you to look at two sides of an argument. So it's either naval tactics or it's something else. So how far is it naval tactics and how far is it something else? And the bullet points where we have fire ships and bad weather indicate something that's to do with naval tactics and something to do with something else. So what we can see here is the first half of an answer which received 16 out of 16 in response to this question. It says, I agree to a certain extent that the main reason for the defeat of the Armada was naval tactics is because although because of Drake, English ships and the Navy's communication were a strong contribution, there were other factors that had an impact, for example, bad weather, Spanish resources, lack of communication that also contributed to the defeat. So we set up here the argument that yes, naval tactics were important, but there are other factors that were also important. It's very 
important that in a line of argument you set up that argument because that is the road map for the rest of your answer. And so what we have here in the next two paragraphs is information about how English naval tactics had an impact on the destruction of the Armada. Talking about fire ships with cannons, it's talking about um, the tactics that England employed, talking about um, Drake and his voyage to disturb Philip's navy, which is a reference to the raid on Cadiz in 1587. So what is missing is the second half of the answer. So what is missing is the other factors that contributed to the defeat of the Armada and then a judgment at the end as to how far naval tactics were more or less important than the other factors. So when you did task three and you looked at why the Armada was defeated and you organised the information into three categories, those three categories were to help you to be able to complete this task which is to finish off this answer. So you need to write the second half of the answer focusing on factors that contributed to the defeat of the Armada that are not English naval tactics and then you need to write a judgment at the end which weighs up how much naval tactics were more or less important than those other factors. Once you've done this uh, send it to your teacher to get some feedback so they can have a look at what you have done. Okay, that brings us to the end of this GCSE Ready Project D on Elizabeth I and the Spanish Armada. Hopefully you have learnt some important material that will help you when you come to study this aspect of the GCSE course in more depth and you've also begun to practice some of the skills that are required to be successful in those GCSE exams. So until next time, take care, stay safe, goodbye.